does not make us afraid. His spirit is a sort of power and love and self-control. The spirit that God gave us, not the spirit of God, but the spirit that God gave us does not make us afraid. What does it do? Um, it's his spirit, his spirit is, a of is a source of power, love, love and self-control. Self so you should not be afraid of anything. Right, we should not be afraid of anything. Like Superman? God gives us this other thing called wisdom, though. And did it not say, did it say sound mind? No, it, it just says... A uh, source of... source of power, love, and self-control. Self-control. So something tells me that your self-control would probably have you not run into a street... And try to stop a car with your mind power or whatever suggestions. So I'm thinking that no, that part not going to happen. Okay, so we're going to um, hit some spots in Genesis 20. We're going to talk about fear. Okay. Fear. Can I had the microphone for a reason? Can you hear me? Yes, I cannot. You're ridiculous. Okay. So, before we talk about Genesis 20, we're going to back up to go to Genesis 19. Genesis yes, 19. dear. No, you're not going nowhere. Verse 1. Leave your bag. What even you don't need it. I didn't, say what, I didn't say what verse, though. We're not going to read anything specific. Just look at a page and pick something? I'm just going to tell you about it. Oh, you already read it. So, in Genesis 19... I, I, a lot of talk back we, a lot of good conversations happening right now okay <laughs> so in Genesis 19 it talks about Sodom, the, him, um, God destroying Sodom and Gomorrah Sodom and Gomorrah were cities that um, had a lot of sexual immorality and a lot of like defunct behavior basically a lot of messed up behavior um, he had come to Abram Abraham his name's already been changed at this point. He come to Abraham and he told Abraham he was going to kill. I mean, not kill, but well, it's killing, but he was going to destroy the cities because they were just like jacked up. Right. So Abraham was like, but what if there's good people, good and moral people that's in there? Are you going to destroy the whole city? Even the good and moral people? Yeah, don't let her touch the Bible. And he said, OK, so they went through this whole back and forth discussion about like, Okay, what if there's 30 people? What if there's 40 people? What if there's 20 people? What if there's 10 people? Like, will you still save the city? He was like, and God was like, yeah, okay. All right, sure. If there's even 10 people. So he has these three angels to, to scour the land. And they went to Abraham's house first and had dinner and stuff and, and talked to Abraham about some stuff and, and told them. Now, God had already been telling Abraham for years, him and Sarah, that he was going to multiply his seed that he was going to that his seed was going to be that of sand and that if somebody could count as much sand as out there in the earth then they would be able to count how you know much generations and that come from abraham so at this point he didn't have any kids and him and sarah were older so it went for years, though, as they prospered and they, they gained more stuff because him and Lot are actually related. And they, yeah, that's who we're going to talk a little bit about. Him and Lot were related and, and they had so much stuff as they started prospering, God started blessing them, that they had too much stuff to live in the same camp, basically, same household, same area, because their stuff was just overwhelming and spreading out. So they decided to go separate ways, even though they were family, to go to, to spread out, basically, so that they each wouldn't, like, cause friction, because their people, their servants and stuff were starting to have friction with each other. So anyway, so... They spread out and they moved to their own little areas, their own little spaces. And Lot eventually worked his way to Sodom and Gomorrah. Okay. And then Abraham was a little ways away from Sodom and Gomorrah. And 
when these angels come, they come with a prophetic word, basically. They come to let them know that the promise and remind them of the promise, but be specific in it this time. Because God had said he was going to increase his seed. He was going to give him seed. He was going to do these things for him. But he hadn't said anything specific to him about like when, how, why, blah, 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 blah. So when these angels come to him, they said in the next year, you're going to have a child. At this point, it's been several years that God's been telling them that he's going to do this for him. And um, they're older now. They're like 100, him and Sarah. They're like really old. Like she, she doesn't even have a cycle anymore to produce eggs and kids. After. All of this is after the flood. Oh, okay. So they only got 21 years. Huh? Then it, oh, 120? Yeah. I'd say you're going on a lot of trips to 100 years. Right, right. So anyway, so... <laughs> even, if you, even if you live, like, for God, and God, I'm perfectly, you just beyond the 100 years. He should probably do whatever he wants to do, because he's God. So this is probably facts. Oh! So, um, but anyway, he, he, the, the angels sit there and tell him like in the next year, it's happening in the next year. And Sarah was in another room, kitchen or whatever. And she overheard it and she laughed to herself and thought, that's ridiculous. Like, I'm not, I can't, I'm not even having cycles. I'm not even, I, for years now, decades now, like my womb is shut up and done with and I'm old and there's no way that I can have kids like she was looking at the situation from her her human standpoint and understanding of how things happen forgetting how God had already protected them blessed them increased what they had done miracles in their lives and things of that nature she forgot all of that apparently when she heard this word because it sounded so outlandish to her at the time anyway she laughed to herself and God said to Abraham well what's she laughing for and she was like, I, I didn't laugh. <laughs> and because she was, she was fearful. I didn't, I didn't laugh. I, I didn't know. It's, uh, yeah, I believe you. I believe you, Lord. And uh, Abraham too, like, didn't, didn't believe it. And so, like, I think they were scared to believe in a dream that big. Sometimes God gives us a promise. And he gives us a word that it is our job to stand on. It's his job to do. It's his, our job to stand on. And it's beyond our comprehension of, of the possibility. So we're almost scared to believe the word because getting our hope into something that could destroy us later is what we're thinking is too much for us. So there was some, there was fear there when she laughed to herself and thought that's just impossible. Like that's not going to happen. And, um, so what happened in the course of the next year or so, well, a little bit before that, you know, they, they just, even the whole, it was like a whole, I it was over 10 years of when God had first started promising them before they had another kid and all, I mean, before they had a kid. And all that stuff. And so they just doubted. They had a lot of doubt. They had a lot of fears. And they, in their fear, they thought that they should figure out how to make the promise come true. So then they started working on that situation. Now, right before. It does, right? So. That's what happened. They had it. He had a kid with, with. Sarah's slave girl because Sarah was trying to figure out a way to make God's promise come true. Yes, God had promised he would have a child with Sarah. But years went by since he had been promising that. And then when the angels spoke a specific date, they just thought it was ridiculous. And when we don't have faith for a thing and we don't believe in a thing and we don't expect a thing, then it kind of cuts God out of the picture. He's still capable of doing it. But if we don't do our part and engage in the belief, like that's all we got to do. 
But some for some people, I know, for some people even having belief is um is a large commodity. It's a large expense on their part to even have the belief. So sometimes having the belief is too much. Um, but we will cut God out of the situation when we decide that we don't believe him at his word. So around the same time or whatever, as the angels come in there, the angels left and they went to Sodom and Gomorrah to check to see if there was, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40 good moral people. So God could save it. And there was gentlemen who saw them come into the town and they saw them go to Lot's house. So they go to Lot's house and some men come to the door and they, they tell Lot that they want the men that came in there. And they want them for sexual and moral reasons. And in Lot's fear, because Lot knows that they're angels, so in his fear, he offers them his daughters instead. Why don't you just go to the angels and be like, please save me from these people. You know. Or go to pray to God, like, give the, give, let these people go away. You know, I think that too. Why, if you know you were sitting amongst those who have been sent by God, did you skip over God when issues came to your door? But he did. Fear grabbed a hold of him in the moment, and he didn't think anything about God's solution. And it's just similar to what just happened at Abraham's house. Like the whole God part, just they glazed over his power, his authority, his sovereignty, his grace, his mercy, his like all of it. Yeah. So they were checking his house and they were checking around, looking around. And they already knew that he had been raised up to, you know, serve God. He'd already had a relationship so with God. And why did the angels be like, Ace? Um, whatever your name, we got this. Because angels are sent by God, and God is a, we always say this, it's cliche, we say God is a gentleman, right? Holy Spirit is a gentleman. He does not force himself upon us. He does not force situations to happen. He offers us revelation and wisdom and knowledge, and then we have a choice of what we want to do. Now, if they've already come into his house and said, and, and he already is aware that they are sent by God, that's your revelation right there. Well, so they fight at the door. He's trying to get the people, the dudes out and they fight at the door or whatever. And the, and the, so the angels close the door and they cause the dudes at the door to go blind so that they can't find how to get in the door. And, uh, but that's what I'm saying. Like that's, that, that should have been from the get go. I don't know why Lot thought he should jump in except for the fact that he was probably, his heart was probably racing he was probably freaking out. He was probably like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. What should I do? I got two daughters. Maybe they'll just take these two daughters. <laughs> like, I can make this work. I can make this work. I'll, it, I'll work it out. And that's what we do, though. That's what we do as humans. That is legit what we do as humans. Like, as soon as a problem hits, as soon as something looks bad, as soon as a situation presents itself and we're freaking out and it's making our whole bodies react with our fear sensory stuff that has been built into us. Like we just react and we, we skip over God. We skip over the fact that, you know, well, you know, God's already saved us so far from this situation. God's already has us in this totally depraved environment and has kept us because his, his daughters hadn't been touched up to that point. Nobody had snatched them up and they obviously was snatching folks in the street. If they was following <laughs> these dudes into his house, they was obviously snatching folks in the street. So he kind of, it's like he, you know, what happens in trauma and fear, wait, like wait, our brain wait, switches wait, off. The they didn't want them because they wanted the dudes. Ah. So that's when they started fighting at the door because they didn't want them. They was like, no, we want them dudes. We just saw them walk up in there, them tall, lanky looking folks we want them so that's what they knew what they wanted they saw what they wanted but it was just showing it was it was also just displaying the fact that this was the character of the place like letting it be known like they need to go like this city needs to go like they ain't got no God should just be like give the one dude a yeah. message you should go live in a different town. well that's what it was so he told them he said get your family together the angels after they 
made the dudes go blind and stuff and they bolted the door closed. He said, get your family together. You need to go now because it, it, we about to wrap this up. <laughs> and because that's what it was. Fire and brimstone came down. We about to wrap this up. You need to go on and get your people and get out. Yeah. Is she right there? Is she right there? Where'd she go? <laughs> She's so ridiculous. <laughs> She's behind me. Messing with the microphone. <laughs> she was so quiet, I didn't know. She was listening to the story. Yeah, so it, she was messing with the microphone. She messed with the buttons. She knows she ain't supposed to touch. That's why she was trying to be quiet. Anyway, um, so yeah, so no. Don't go back over there. Don't go back over there. So he told me he needed to get his stuff, they, that he needed to get everybody in the house and they needed to get out and they needed to go because the fire and brimstone was about to come down. So they're sitting there and then guess what they do? What? They don't leave right away. He lingers because they don't want to leave their home. They don't want to leave their friends. They don't want to leave the lifestyle that they have. They're like, are you sure? Do we really have to go? They trying to pack bags. They trying to get all the stuff that they really like, that they want to take to the new place. Then they worried about folks and then all this other stuff. Like they link, they, God said, this is what you need to do. The messengers of God said, let's go. Like they went here for like a couple days? No, like just a moment because they were like, no, you got to go. So they literally took them by the hand was like, you got to go. But that's again. Yeah, that again is how we do. That's how we do when we're when we're working in fear and not the spirit of God, because what did it say in Second Timothy one seven, that God didn't give us a spirit of fear. Yeah, He didn't give us one to be afraid, but He gave us one that was power, love, and self control. She wants she wants to wipe her nose. And there's other translations that say. That he given us that he's given us a sound mind. Meaning that he's given us wisdom, he's given us clear clarity, he's given us discernment, he's given us the ability to see into a situation and figure out what we need to do and not be frantic and just reacting with our emotions. So anyway, as they're leaving. His, his wife, because it was told to them, you know, when you go, don't look back. Did his, wife look his wife looks back and she turns into a pillar of salt immediately. The Bible's kind of weird what they, like, choose to turn people into <laughs> and, like, and, But it's interesting because, like, we, we can use, there's different things that they do in the Bible that, that turns into ways that we talk and sayings and stuff like that. So then it, it allows for us to like have all these puns because you know, when somebody acts a certain way, you call them being salty. <laughs> and yeah, like when someone's, when someone's probably lying and not totally honest and not totally truthful and not totally straightforward, you say, take it with a grain of salt. And then God tells us, you know, that we are the salt and light in the world. Like we're supposed to add to things and we're supposed to set apart stuff and we're supposed to be in the midst of something and make discernment about God's presence in a situation when we're in it. And um, so anyway, there's lots of puns and different things you can pull out of that. The fact that she turned into a pillar of salt. And I'm sure plenty of people have probably done a study about what type of salt she turned into. Like, well, if our bodies are made out of water and maybe she was just like, like the fire just vaporized her. Because also in the word, it says that we are here as if a vapor. <laughs> I'm sure there's probably plenty of versions that people probably preach that. But anyway, point is, she was dead. She was gone. And it was Lot and his two virgin daughters that continued to flee 
And then fear still remained in their household. Because when they get to a cave to hide, the daughters are like, every other man, like they're like Lot goes to sleep and the daughters are talking to each other. And one of them's like, every other man in the world is gone. Our dad is the only man around, which was not true. But in their mind, because they saw their city destroyed, or they knew their city was being destroyed, they felt like everybody in the world was gone now. So they're like, every, there's no other men. We're going to have to lay with our dad so we can get pregnant, so we can carry on the world, basically, like all dramatic, like, so we can have seeds and his name can live and da 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 da, this, that, and the other. Because what happens when we're all so afraid and we make stupid choices and we're making perverted choices and we're making sinful choices we start trying to make it make sense but there ain't no way to make it make sense so anyway the one daughter was talking to the other daughter <laughs> and trying to come up with this this justification like that we should we should just go lay with dad we get him drunk then we can lay with them each of us separately and then no they had stuff they took with them so apparently that was the main priority that they thought they should take was their wine. Maybe they weren't so just. Maybe they should have stayed in the city. I'm just saying. <laughs> because, but fear makes you do stupid, stupid stuff. It does. It makes you do stupid, stupid stuff. There are people who have destroyed their entire lives when their first choice was out of fear. And why didn't they leave sooner? Like when the girls were like little kids. When he saw like well, apparently they liked being there. For some reason, they like being in the midst of stuff. There are holy people who like being in sinful situations. Just saying. That's, it's weird. It is. It is weird. But there are people who like to be just on the cusp of what ain't supposed to be right. Some people like to be on it because they like to talk about those who aren't living right. And somehow it makes them feel better about their situation. And more righteous to say how... These people are unrighteous. Some people like to be on the cusp because they just want to be in the midst all the time of some nonsense going down. Some people like to be in the cusp and right there at the edge of the nonsense because they benefit from it and profit from it. They have friends that come and talk to them with their nonsense. They maybe have a business that's counseling or therapy or something of that nature, and then they get to benefit off the nonsense. Maybe they sell things to the people that's going through nonsense, own a liquor store, own a CBD store, own a weed store, whatever it is. Maybe you don't participate in it, but you get to sell stuff to folks and benefit from it. That's because she just wants to pull out stuff. And that just happens to be what's in her bag. That'll preach. <laughs> it does. Okay, so my granddaughter's pulling out stuff that's in her bag, and it's all pants. Which actually legit makes sense because, again, it goes with our, our, our discussion about fear. The reason a lot of us interact with fear in a certain way and we start making those stupid choices is because we haven't built up anything else in our bag. We haven't put anything else in our system except for fear, except for, and that's why, like I said, so you saw how they were living out of fear. You saw the fact that the mama was turning around because she just could not bear to leave without looking one last time. And therefore it, it was radiating through the girls too for them to sit there and be like, well, we got to sleep with our dad because what else is we going to do? Like, we, we got to have kids and, and, and this, that, and the other. As if God didn't just save you from a situation. So you don't think he's made provisions for how more kids and more this and that? Because there were still the whole rest of the world they didn't even recognize. They thought the whole world had, would, was gone when they saw it just because their one little city was gone. The city, was it not near any other towns or cities? It'd be kind of like here. We're in Dover, yet the next town is seven miles one way and eight miles the other way. So, so if Dover wanted to be, if, they, if God wanted to destroy Dover, he could do so without destroying the other towns around. Yeah, I know that, but like, did they not ever see any other people going in and out, going to different places? I don't know. I think it was just, your, all your senses are cut off when you're, when you're motivated and you're moving in panic and trauma. You know when we talk about a certain somebody in our household, 
or used to be in our household and now that she just don't function and it just don't make sense, the stuff she do. Because when you're in shock, trauma, fear, panic, all your other senses get cut off. And legit, when your body reacts that way, it is, it's made to do that. Because it's made for like if an animal comes attack you, that your blood rushes to the parts of your body that's going to have to defend you from the animal, not the logical part of your brain that needs to, you know, do this, that, and the other, like math problems. Like you not, you not getting a course of blood to the region of your brain that wants to do math problems, you getting courses of blood to the area that needs to defend you physically. Like when you on the football field, the part of your body that needs to react to the physical threat of somebody coming this way and you having to go that way, that's what your body is going to immediately react to. So there is hormones and reactions and nerves and everything like that, that legit when you are fearful, start to pulse. But that's why like God gives us this, this amazing grace, right? That's why he tells us he doesn't give us a spirit of fear and he gives us the opportunity to engage in that spirit that he's given us. Her cup is up here. Because if, if we engage in the spirit that he's given us, then that bypasses and it turns off all of that, the system that wanted to freak out and say like, this is what we need to do. Like, I just gotta react, I just gotta do this. I just gotta go get high. I just gotta go lay with somebody. I just gotta go gamble. I just gotta go like, spend some money. I got to buy some stuff. I got to eat some stuff. Like it bypasses those triggers whenever we engage the spirit of God. Does that make sense? So again, it's just like the situation that Abraham and Lot were in of why would you not engage God into your situation? Why would you not pull what he can do into your situation? And God even reminds Abraham when he, when they get the prophetic word that says they're going to have a kid. He even sits there and pulls Abraham to the side and was like, is there anything impossible for me? Cause Abraham's like, we old, how are we going to have a kid now? We old. God's like, is there anything impossible? Like I literally, Keep the earth spinning at a certain tilt on its axis. Here, come give her water. I know, but if you give her something to drink, it might distract her. She looking for a blanket. Give her your hoodie. Go give her a hoodie and turn off that air. Yeah, she's looking for a blanket. She's sleepy. That's why she's looking for a blanket. But yeah, so there, there's a lot of opportunities here that we see in Genesis that we're not, they're like lessons basically, because all of us humans act in the same way. I know it's easy now, for you to look at the situation and go, why didn't they do that? Why didn't they do this? That doesn't make any sense. Why wouldn't they just do this? But all of us react that kind of way. Like we all got it built into us and it's just about what you put in your bag. Like I was talking about her and her pants. Like it's, it's what you put into your bag that's gonna allow you to pull out something different than, than fear, something different than panic, something different than shock and trauma. Like. Because legit situations happen in life that are serious and hardcore. Because, I mean, that's pretty serious having people come to your house and try to break in so that they can rape some folks. Like, that's pretty serious. I mean, that would, that would put, put all of us in a panic. It's easy to look at the situation now and say, like, well, that was dumb. But it would put all of us in a panic. But what God tries to build in us through these stories of what other people went through and how they failed is the fact that, like, we see how God still provides and therefore off of that, you know how earlier when we did testimonies, I said like there's, there's spiritual principles about giving your testimony because God tells us like through the testimony, that's where people get their deliverance and their freedom and they build their faith 
and, and there's stuff about doing your testimony. So when we read these stories, it's us hearing their testimonies and that's to build our faith and that's to build our understanding of how God works and how he maneuvers. And that's for us to be able to sit there and, and sit on when a situation comes to our doors because you're going to have them like you just now you a freshman in high school and you got a lot of years of situations and peer pressures, which is legitimately just somebody putting fear on you. And, you know, football games and injuries and hurts and girlfriends and friends and all that other stuff. Cars breaking down, having to pay bills. Like there's a whole life of things and situations that present us with panic or fear. So the point is now when you're not in fear for you to learn the skills of how to hold on to the, the faith that you build and the, the knowledge of like what it is that God does and how he moves and like seeing the stuff like, cause you know, I talk about your testimony all the time, like where God has brought you from, but we can think about like when we had the car wreck and we flipped and flipped and flipped and flipped and none of us was hurt. Like all uh, Taya got was that sore hand and that was it. And legit, we probably should have died. Like some of us should have been taken out in that cause people having that same type of wreck do not make it out. And all of us were good. That's a faith builder. Like that's, that's, that's something, a miracle that you can hold on to and know when another situation comes to you, like God's already brought me through that. Even us surviving the fire, like you guys being in the house and surviving the fire. Sable surviving when she opened that door because the backdraft, the firemen were like, there's no way she should have survived. Like that should have, that should have did some damage. When she opened that door, the oxygen that was brought into that room should have created a backdraft that, that blew her out the way. But it didn't because God's hands, his providence, the way he provides, the way he, he maneuvers things for us sometimes when we're too stupid and ignorant to even recognize it. Like there's legit a whole bunch of those situations in, in our lives that sometimes after time, we just forget about it and we move on. And then we don't remember when a situation pops. So you gotta hold on to those things when, when situations pop up. Let's pray so we can go home and take a nap. We gonna go home and take a nap, dear God. <laughs> We thank you for today. We thank you for the opportunity to be in your word and to share um, our understanding about it for you to just do what you do. Holy Spirit, we thank you. We ask that you just cement this to us right now, not just for TJ, not just for myself, but even in Amara and the, in the spirit that she has right now. Let her have understanding, Lord God, about fear and how your presence is always with us and never away from us. And you are always got your hands on us. You're always protecting us. And all we got to do is engage you and not ignore you. And we thank you for that, Lord, that you are always watching us, that you are always keeping us in the blessings and the miracles that you have already placed our lives and brought through our lives. And we are just ecstatic about it and humbled by it and thankful. Be with us the rest of the day and the week, Lord God. Be with TJ in his game tomorrow, keep all the kids safe. Let it be a good situation and let the jackets win. Jesus name, amen.